remember about becoming a teenager? Scary question. <laughs> Maybe it was waking up one morning to discover that your body was shaped completely differently. Or maybe you remember some of the more questionable decisions that you made, like the perm that I got when I was 13. I thought it would make me look like Drew Barrymore, made me look like a poodle. <laughs> or maybe you remember becoming class clown or an athlete or a loner. Or maybe you remember getting sick. I'm talking about the sickness of despair, emotional pain, loss of happiness, and for some people, wanting to die. We call this sickness depression, and it is both common and deadly. One in three people will experience clinical depression in their lifetime. And every year, two and three quarter million deaths can be attributed to depression and related sicknesses. But despite this, despite the high prevalence and deadly costs of depression, there remains so much that we don't understand about this sickness. We have no objective diagnostic test for depression, no spinal tap or x-ray. And we have no way of forecasting depression for a specific person, no genetic marker that can tell us about your risk. And so we're left with a lot of questions. What is depression? Where does it come from? Why does it happen? And who is at the highest risk? Answering these questions is the cornerstone of my research work. I'm a clinical psychologist and neuroscientist and director of a research laboratory centered on mood disorders like depression. In my lab, we believe that one of the important keys for understanding depression is to pay attention to when depression tends to start. The teen years, which also happen to be a time of profound brain, cognitive, and social development. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. First, what is it about teen development that may make young people especially vulnerable to depression? And second, what can we do to foster emotional health in teens and in the rest of us? But let me back up and start by talking a little bit about development. Adolescence is a kind of developmental Bermuda Triangle. I say this because it's characterized by three converging developmental events. First, teen brains are changing. Don't get me wrong, neurodevelopment is unfolding throughout childhood, but it's getting into late childhood and early adolescence that guess what happens? Puberty, which brings with it a cascade of hormones that interact with changing brain structure, function, and communication. Here's a little bit of a sidebar on the neuroscience of brain communication. In humans, one way that we measure brain communication is by looking to see what parts of the brain are active at the same time. You can think of this like watching a Christmas tree to see which lights blink on and off together. And we call this synchronized activation functional connectivity. And we interpret it to mean that those parts of the brain are talking to one another. They are functionally connected. The spatial pattern of functional connectivity across the whole brain makes a kind of a map. Sets of intersecting functional networks that reflect how different parts of the brain talk to one another. And here's the cool part. Moving from childhood into the teen years and even the early 20s, we see a remarkable reorganization of these functional networks. Earlier in childhood, networks tend to be more strongly local. That is, neighboring parts of the brain like to talk to one another. But moving into the teen years and a bit beyond, larger functional networks become more strongly synchronized and organized around hub brain areas, parts of the network that talk to both close and distant parts of the brain. One way to think about these functional networks is to imagine that they are like the pattern of flights between airports. In younger kids, most of the flights in our pattern are domestic hops between airports that are relatively close by one another. But it's getting into the teen years that we add more and faster transcontinental flights that go through key airline hubs. Try going anywhere in this country without going through O'Hare. 
The same principle is true in the brain, and this reconfiguration of networks allows messages to pass faster and more efficiently between distant parts of the globe, or in our case, distant parts of the brain. This network reorganization is important. It's important because different parts of the brain are set up to be good at different kinds of jobs. So when local neighboring parts of the brain talk to one another, those smaller networks can be very good at specific kinds of jobs, things like recognizing mom's face. But it's when multiple distributed parts of the brain become more strongly synchronized that large-scale functional brain networks can be involved in complex cognitive jobs, things like being able to regulate your emotions or adapt to a changing world. And that's the second major developmental event of the teen years, improvements in higher-order cognitive functions, these kinds of self-regulatory abilities. Remember back to when you were an early teen? How did you react to stress or something dangerous but exciting in your world. Early on, most of us were not so great at regulating our feelings or impulses in those contexts. But as we move through the teen years, we get better, a lot better, at self-regulation. And it's a good thing that we do, because the third major developmental event is the intense set of social changes and transitions to independence that we all navigate. A first romance a first frenemy, leaving your parents' house, starting in the workforce, these are all normal challenges, but they're also substantial stressors, and navigating those stressors in healthy ways requires, you guessed it, extraordinary self-regulation. Now, you might be wondering, what does any of this have to do with depression? Well, given the dynamic nature of teen neurodevelopment, Perhaps it comes as no surprise that this Bermuda Triangle is a window of risk. Teen brain and cognitive systems are changing, and that malleability may make us more susceptible to disruption. What that means is that unusual, very intense, or traumatic stress events in the teen years can have bigger and more lasting impacts on mental health than if the same kinds of events occurred later in adulthood. Think of it like building a house. The structure is most vulnerable to damage while the foundation is being poured. But there's good news too. The same teen developmental dynamics that make this a window of risk also make it a window of opportunity. Those normal challenges, learning to drive, going to college, they can also be deeply enriching and boost brain resilience if we have the right support and scaffolding to develop coping skills. And it gets better because any of us at any age can build resilience, and not just resilience, but thriving. Yes, our brains are less dynamic after the teen years, but that doesn't mean that older brains are static. Our brains are functionally changing all the time. Your brains are changing right now as you listen to me speak, and they will change if you Learn Italian or heal from depression. Remember that any house can be remodeled even many decades after the foundation was built. So what can we do to thrive? Well, we can take care of ourselves. Adequate sleep, nutrition, physical activity, spending time with the people who are good for us. These are wellness practices that we can all try to build into our daily lives. And although they sound like small steps, when these practices become wellness habits, they lay an important foundation for emotional sturdiness. Second, we can choose our stress. Stress can be good for us at any age. If we are purposeful in choosing some of our stress experiences and the coping skills that we intend to deploy, I might apply for a job or try to make a new friend, knowing that I may get rejected, but prepared to lean on my family or go for a hike or take the dog for a walk, whatever it is that keeps me well. And then those coping skills are in my toolbox and ready for the stress that I don't choose. Third, 
we can foster a culture of openness and eradicate the stigma around mental illness. Yes, depression is a mental sickness and it is a physical sickness. It is a sickness that manifests or is reflected in the brain. And guess what? Your brain is part of your body. Depression is no less real and no more shameful than cardiovascular disease or diabetes. And just like those sicknesses, depression is treatable, but we have to be willing to talk about it in order to get help. And finally, as a community, we can highlight depression as a public health priority that is just as important as any other deadly illness. And we can support medical science aimed at discovering new truths about depression. Because although there remains so much that we don't understand about depression, we do know this. Yes, depression may indeed be a sickness of the brain. But having depression does not mean that your brain is broken. You are not broken. You and we can thrive. Thank you. Thank you.